Well, welcome to this Washington Institute uh, Policy Forum, uh, Virtual Policy Forum, uh, which is on uh, Ido Levy's uh, new text on, uh, on the Islamic State. And, uh, and we're also going to be hearing from uh, Professor Craig Whiteside uh, about uh, some of the work that's been undertaken uh, by him and uh, his, uh, his collaborators on uh, Islamic State as well. So I'm Dr. Mike Knights uh, at, the, uh, at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, I'm uh, the Jill and Jay Bernstein Fellow in the Military and Security Studies Program. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have everyone joining us here today. Uh, what we're going to do uh, is that first uh, we're going to have uh, Ido presenting some of the material from his new study, uh, which I'll hold up to you in, in the, the format I've got it, which is uh, in uh, manuscript format from when uh, uh, Ido was building the, uh, the study. It's called Soldiers of End Times, and it's now available uh, at the Washington Institute uh, website uh, as an ebook. Uh, and uh, can be uh, easily downloaded from there. I strongly recommend you um, you get a copy uh, of the book uh, because it's one of the most detailed analyses of how the Islamic State fought in the Iraq Syria environment as a conventional or semi-conventional military force. Um, so today we're going to hear from Edo. We're going to hear uh, from Craig. Uh, and then we're going to move to Q and A. Um, if you have questions uh, that you want to send in, and you're viewing through live stream, YouTube, uh, or the website, uh, then you can send those questions through email uh, to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. So that's policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. I'll be repeating that later after the presentations uh, in case anyone missed it there. And those questions will all drop into the uh, my general chat room and I'll be able to deconflict and combine questions uh, so that we get through a good amount of them in the hour we have set aside for this briefing. Um, so, you know, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce now Ido Levy. Uh, who's an associate fellow working with the Institute's Military and Security Studies program. Uh, he's the author of the new book, uh, Soldier, Soldiers of End Times, Assessing the Military Effectiveness of the Islamic State, uh, which, as I said, is now available as an e-book on the Washington Institute uh, website. Uh, he's a uh, very promising young analyst who, you know, basically can't wait to be a PhD and out there in the world publishing and uh, lecturing. If you uh, look at some of his studies already, which have uh, appeared in Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, Terrorism and Political Violence, Small Wars Journal, uh, and other places, plus this, this new book length uh, study, uh, Soldiers of End Times, uh, you know, he's getting a lot of research out there. He's very active, and I can't wait to, uh, to hear from him today. Just on a personal note, uh, helping Edo to shape this study and you know, review it and so on. It's very much like um, a PhD supervisor experience. And what we ended up with at the end was not a 15,000 word policy focus, uh, but was instead a book length study uh, that you know, stands alongside any other study on the Islamic State as a, a very useful text uh, to, uh, to take a look at. So uh, Edo is gonna present some slides on the, uh, on the book. Uh, you know, the research question of uh, the book, as he'll talk about, was explaining, analysing the military effectiveness, the conventional military effectiveness of uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, uh, really from 2014 onwards. But more uh, broadly, it was about uh, how jihadist groups conventionalise, when they conventionalise, uh, you know, what are the sources of strength when they conventionalise, and which are the theories about the conventionalization of jihadist forces, um, how do those theories combine and how can they be combined into a meta theory? Um, so, Ido, without further ado, uh, take it away. Uh, we'll get your slides up on the screen and, uh, you know, give us uh, whatever it is you're thinking of, like 20 minutes, etc., cetera, on, uh, on your topic. And then we'll move over to Craig uh, for a similar kind of presentation. Then we'll get to Q&A. Thanks very much. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. That was a wonderful introduction. It's an honor to be here with uh, Professor Craig Whiteside as well. Um, yeah, I'll just get into it. Uh, we can share my slides. Um, so as Mike said, that's my book, uh, Soldiers of End Times. Uh, it's really uh, what you see on the cover is pretty uh, exemplary of kind of how the Islamic State was fighting was like, uh, not much heavy equipment and a cameraman on the battlefield, uh, which is all the um, very, uh, we'll get all, into all of that. So next slide, please. So uh, the first thing I looked at, uh, what kind of triggered this study was, uh, we, we tend to focus on jihadist groups as terrorist groups, which obviously they are, but um, they are also groups that seek to control territory, to govern territory. <clears throat> they want this huge empire stretching from Spain, as you see on this map, uh, all the way into Central Asia and beyond. Um, and the way that they, they do that, that they seek to do that is through war. And for to, to be able to do that, they would need uh, abilities that gave them conventional prowess. They would need to stand up to other conventional armies. And uh, we see this uh, with the Islamic State in particular, we've seen um, you know, cap the capture of tanks, uh, use of anti-tank weapons, all these symbols of conventional warfare. Uh, but we ha we've also seen it in the past. We've seen the Taliban in Afghanistan just recently and also in the 90s uh, um, wage a conventional war against uh, adversaries that, were, that had advanced capabilities in many cases. Uh, we've seen similar things in Yemen. Uh, we've seen it in, in uh, Africa, uh, many places, wherever jihadists are, when they're given the opportunity, they will conventionalize. They will try to get conventional uh, warfare capabilities to take territory in order to govern it. Uh, and so if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll tell you how that worked out with uh, ISIS. So with ISIS, um, because uh, as I mentioned, the, the jihadi uh, groups, they always look for this conventional warfare. It's, it comes from their ideology originally uh, because what they seek is an empire uh, and they, they seek to defend it as well. Uh, and the ideology of uh, ISIS uh, brought in an additional component of apocalypticism, uh, which meant that the empire, the establishment of the empire could not wait uh, because the end times are approaching and the only way to be a part of the end times is uh, by uh, having that empire. So that kind of gave an urgency to the Islamic State that uh, uh, set, it on, uh, set it on an accelerated course of conventionalization. The other aspect of that is the organizational development, all the groundwork that, uh, that uh, went into its military effectiveness, that all came in during the Iraq war, for example, the development of uh, large bomb making capabilities of uh, suicide uh, car bombs, of developing suicide bombs to uh, for use in battle in the battlefield on the battlefield was uh, that was all done beforehand. And when we look at how they actually performed on the battlefield, we come and we have uh, these four components that I came up with. Uh, they also draw on a lot of other academic theories uh, that that have been posited by uh, Professor Whiteside, Craig Whiteside, as well as uh, Dr. Mike Knights on this. Uh, on this uh, event, as well as from others, uh, Dr. Veramir Nova, um, Dr. Hash uh, Ahmed Hashem, uh, and many, many others uh, who I've drawn on uh, for this study. Um, so the first component I look at is uh, innovation, particularly in the organizational uh, sense. Uh, huge upscaling of bomb making capabilities that allowed them to, to use uh, suicide uh, bombs as kind of an industrial uh, as an with an industrial capacity. They built like thousands of these things. Uh, and uh, what you see is uh, them using suicide car bombs, which I, I put here as SVB IEDs, uh, which is a fancy word, just it means suicide vehicle born uh, improvised explosive devices. But I don't really like the, the term improvised in the case of ISIS because these weren't really improvised. The, ISIS had huge uh, factories, they had uh, experts in bomb making. They had their own designs and standardizations that they used to build all these bombs. And they would use them in, in many ways as a way that a conventional army might use artillery or might use airstrikes, for example. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is huge swell in manpower that uh, got, they got through an unprecedented wave of foreign fighters that came to Syria uh, during the, uh, particularly in 2013, 2014. 
Um, and this huge, tens of thousands of foreign fighters, they came out, many of them came with uh, ex uh, expertise that wasn't available in the region at the time, uh, with former fighting experience in other theaters of combat, uh, and et cetera. And that really helped them scale up the organization to have something that looks like a real army. Uh, the other thing was shaping operations, something uh, particularly uh, I draw on Professor Whiteside's research for this uh, revolutionary war theory that they really uh, were good at engaging tribal groups in areas that they were that they conquered, uh, infiltrating enemy forces, uh, putting sleeper cells in places, especially if you look at how they seized Mosul in uh, June of 2014, um, that relied partially on sleeper cells. Uh, assassinating key leaders that would kind of disorient uh, enemy forces. And once all this is done, it made, it made it very easy for them to go in and uh, defeat the enemy, even if they're outnumbering them or, uh, or have more advanced uh, capabilities. Uh, a key aspect is also will to fight. Uh, what you see with ISIS is a, um, probably its most consistent trait in its, uh, in its military capabilities is how determined its fighters were. And a big part of this is ideology, um, because uh, ISIS really emphasized uh, kind of volunteerism and commitment to the cause, and they and also emphasize indoctrination. Uh, if you like, if anyone would join ISIS, one of the things that they they would emphasize is constantly uh, indoctrinating them with ISIS ideology. And as Professor Weiss, I can probably tell you more about, uh, they also had. Uh, embedded in their military units uh, and that, like officers whose whole job was indoctrination and also keeping up morale through uh, ideological um, motivation. Um, another aspect is coercion. We know also that leaving ISIS was not allowed and they would, you know, they would kill you if you tried to leave. So, that, so for a lot of ISIS fighters, uh, standing and fighting was also a way for them uh, to survive being killed by their own uh, organization. And also there were other times when uh, battle, the battle, uh, like for the Battle of Mosul, for example, they were surrounded. They didn't really have a way to escape. And that, that was another aspect. Another thing is stimulation. Uh, this is, uh, there are three big aspects here. One of them was economics. Uh, ISIS did offer um, money to anyone who joined. Uh, there was there was sometimes a signing bonus. Uh, they had salaries for fighters, and sometimes those salaries would be higher than in other industries in the area. So that be, that was one stimulant. Uh, another thing was uh, captagon, which is a, a drug that now is getting a lot of attention in the Middle East. This is a it's an amphetamine that increases uh, you know any uh, it lets you go on for longer awake. It can uh, increases your your senses. Uh, really lets you do kind of like superhuman uh, stuff for a, for a short period of time, for a period of time. Um, and that also helped uh, ISIS fighters uh, in their will to fight. Last thing is uh, keeping the initiative. Uh, what we see is once um, ISIS has these very determined fighters fighting against brittle adversaries that they uh, helped shape through um, engagement, infiltration, things like that. Uh, it, it was important for them to keep the initiative and, and keep on a offensive action because uh, any enemy that could consolidate itself, re reinforce itself, uh, would have been harder for them to defeat because of their lack of advanced weapons uh, and uh, many, many other uh, factors that we can talk about later as well. So if we can go to the next slide. So all of this uh, kind of translates into an ISIS way of war. How, how does ISIS fight when they conventionalize? There's a huge emphasis on will to fight. Uh, maximizing the morale differential so that your fighters will be as determined as possible and the enemy will be as uh, demoralized as possible before the engagement occurs. Uh, that's why uh, I also mentioned strenuous uh, uh, efforts to break enemy willpower. Innovative uh, model of conventional warfare because it's using suicide bombs, which we know really is uh, weapons of terrorism, uh, mostly, and they use them in uh, on the battlefield for conventional uh, to achieve uh, gains in conventional warfare. Uh, the, like I said, the car bombs were a big thing. They would ar armor them sometimes, as you can see with the bulldozer in this in this picture. They would they would uh, put more armor with metal plates, scales, uh, other things to make these massive, massive uh, machines that could uh, that cause the that, that that they would use for shock to create shock on the battlefield and also to to uh, breach barriers. Uh, we actually saw that recently. Uh, if you're following with the, um, 
the Hasaka prison break in Syria, uh, where they did use uh, suicide car bombs in this way. And, and that's kind of another thing that I would emphasize is ISIS has been very good at retaining this organizational knowledge uh, and also passing it on to new, new recruits. And uh, that, that is very relevant to fighting them today because they still have these capabilities to some extent. Um, and so we should keep that in mind. The last thing I would mention is the relationship with their provinces. We all hear about uh, ISIS uh, groups pledging allegiance to ISIS in other countries from Nigeria uh, and the Philippines and Afghanistan, Sinai Peninsula. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, how much support they get from these provinces and Professor White can also talk about that. But um, uh, what I would emphasize is everyone that pledged allegiance to ISIS, whether they were allied with Al-Qaeda or doing their own thing before that, they all made efforts to conventionalize their own capabilities. We probably see this the most with uh, the Philippines where you had these, these jihadist groups that some of them did have experience with conventional warfare, but a lot of them that came together didn't really have much or they were, or they were not much more than gangs. And then we see them making real efforts to uh, take territory, hold and defend it, uh, something that they wouldn't have done before. And also they, they got a lot of advising support from ISIS. Sometimes they would receive um, foreign fighters or fighters from the organization in Iraq and Syria um, to uh, help increase their capabilities. That's the, we see that the most uh, the ISIS um, franchise uh, affiliate in Libya, which uh, absorbed a large amount of fighters from Iraq and Syria. Also many fighters who went from North Africa to Syria and then later came back with that experience. Um, and they used it to also conventionalize their, themselves. And, and we see the same thing with, uh, with Nigeria as well. Uh, so there are a lot of examples of this. Uh, we can talk more about that if uh, people want. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. Uh, so some implications of this for today uh, that I think are important. Um, the jihadist way of warfare, it's, it's here to stay. Uh, like I said, it's in their ideology. Uh, a lot of us uh, kind of think of, uh, of these groups as just terrorists that, that want to be underground, that don't want to uh, do stand-up fights, but actually they really do. And if given the opportunity, they will, as we've seen uh, in Syria and Iraq, as we've seen recently in Afghanistan with the Taliban, uh, and also in the past with the Taliban, as we see now in Africa over the past couple of years, also ISIS um, uh, groups that pledge allegiance to ISIS in Africa have been making uh, big efforts to take territory. We saw that in Mozambique in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, in Nigeria, we continue to see it. Uh, so it's here to stay and we should really keep that in mind. Uh, and a lot, we also have to remember that the forces that beat ISIS, uh, that defeated the caliphate, the territory of ISIS. In Iraq and Syria, those were our partner forces. So in Iraq, uh, it was the, the counterterrorism service, the Peshmerga, the Iraqi army as a whole. Uh, they were the ones who defeated ISIS on the ground. And we have to uh, keep that relationship with them uh, in order to uh, make sure that ISIS doesn't come back because we also played a big role. We, the United States, played a big role in supporting them with airstrikes, training, uh, many uh, important issues that I go into in my, in, in my book uh, that enabled them to have this victory. And we have to uh, continue and stick with them uh, to make sure that they'll continue to have this. In Syria as well, the Syrian Democratic Forces um, which Mike Knights wrote a whole book about, uh, which is very interesting. And um, you, uh, that, it's the same, the same thing there. We, uh, we enabled them with airstrikes, training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we have, to, we have to keep that long-term relationship. And another thing we have to do is, is foster uh, innovation and determination. These things are really difficult to do, but they can only be done in a long-term relationship because ISIS has been so innovative, as I've, as I've uh, described, using uh, suicide bombs. Uh, and and uh, other other weapons in different ways, uh, and all their innovative uh, traits, um, we have to match that somehow. And the way that you do that is through uh, constantly working with your partners, uh, helping, um, doing maybe officer exchanges, doing uh, training, uh, helping them with uh, different technologies and weapons. And uh, th that's that's uh, just a very important point there. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is technology. A lot of the times our partner forces, uh, the, the edge that they had was because of our advanced technology, we could bring that to bear and help them uh, in, in conventional warfare situations. Particularly, we see that with air power, uh, with airstrikes, 
but we also see it with uh, artillery. Uh, we see it with uh, a lot of uh, advisory uh, assistance and even some um, new technologies uh, that will be important in the future, such as uh, counter unmanned air vehicle um, technologies now that drones are becoming a bigger issue on the Middle East battlefield, for example. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, so we can go to the next slide now. So that, uh, that's the general overview. I'd love to take any questions and I'll uh, hand it over to Craig Lloyd's side now. Uh, you can see my Twitter, LinkedIn, and please read my book it's, uh, if you wanna know more. Thanks very much, uh, Edo. And um, the book that Edo was talking about was, uh, that was done by myself and uh, Vlava Vilgeberg is Accidental Allies uh the um the u.s syrian democratic forces partnership against the islamic state again available at the washington institute website or as a hardback via ib taurus um and my uh partner in that book is uh, on today's call today somewhere in the background so next we're gonna hey, hear from uh <laughs> yeah next we're gonna hear from um uh, associate Professor Craig Whiteside, he's an Associate Professor at the US Naval War College, Associate Fellow with the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague, and a Fellow with George Washington University's Program on Extremism. Uh, a former US Army officer with Iraq experience, uh, he co-authored the 2020 book, The ISIS Reader, Milestone Texts of the Islamic State Movement, which is highly recommended. Um, so, Craig, uh, over to you, and uh, and then afterwards we'll move to uh, Q and A, and you can kick us off if you uh, if you like. Over. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I thank the Washington Institute, my many friends there, uh, Michael, uh, but also Aaron, Matthew, and uh, a lot of friends who've joined us in the in the audience. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to start off out this, I'm acting as the discussant on, on this book. I've had the, the privilege and pleasure of reading it twice, once when it was in uh, production and then once again in the, in the final version and uh, just give some, uh, I'd like to give some thoughts on that. Here, I've been invited to give some thoughts on that and so I'll take advantage of that invitation. Let's see if I can advance this. No, it doesn't like to, it doesn't want to. There we go. So uh, this made me think about writings on Islamic State military tactics and operations, who's doing this writing. I tried to put uh, some of the more prominent and regular members uh, who's been writing that. Michael is one of those. And I, and I, I, I kind of placed them in a spectrum from very, very broad on the top uh, to very narrow focuses. Uh, the bottom are suicide bombing and the evolution from the very early uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq era, all the way through the Battle of Mosul. And so you can see uh, lots of different categories of writers. And I was thinking about where Ito's work here uh, on the Islamic State's military effectiveness. And it's really at the very top. It is, it's a comprehensive uh, and quite detailed look at uh, Islamic State military uh, tactics and operations, even strategy, uh, all across the spectrum. Uh, what I'd say is that it has uh, expansive investigations, multiple case studies, uh, talks about them in time and space, and includes the far provinces. And so this is this is a work that is, is quite comprehensive and very helpful in putting together the pieces that many of the people in these lower tiers not have have contributed parts of the picture to, but Ito uh, very adeptly kind of pulls all of these threads together in, in a readable, uh, but also very uh, understandable uh, argument that I think is quite successful. And I just talk about some aspects of that moving forward here. A lot of, uh, a lot of this book is about innovation and it's about innovation in the military uh, sphere. And uh, these are some areas that I've thought about uh, in looking at very similar uh, aspects of the Islamic State, although not as comprehensive as, as Ito has. So I'll just comment on these particular areas, which he touched on briefly in his, his discussion. So I'll try to keep them fairly, uh, fairly brief. Uh, the Revolutionary Warfare Act aspect, Yes, this is a book about the conventionalization of, of, a, of, a, of a fairly successful 
uh, and uh, a guerrilla force with uh, a great reputation in the irregular warfare space. And yet they're able to make the transition and evolution into uh, a conventional force. Um, I think, and, and Ido understands this when he, when, he dis- when, he, when he discusses it as a shaping operation and the, it's the ability to be successful in irregular warfare, the assassinations of rivals, subversion, tribal engagement, carrots and sticks with local populations that are very important in controlling territory that enables this conventionalization. I think he understands the, the importance of, of the revolutionary war concepts, which are not unique to the Islamic State. They're, they're historic in, in, in several ways. But he understands the importance of them in, in being able to transition to higher levels of an insurgency, which largely requires these conventional capabilities. Uh, the next one is, is their experimentation with special operations. Uh, the picture here from the 2012 Haditha raid, where they took over Haditha for, uh, with about 100 soldiers, well-trained, equipped, and made to look like Iraqi special operations forces. Uh, and then killing their, taking over the town and killing their enemies, some of them from 2007, to show their long memory. Uh, special operations requires intense uh, training equipment, specialized units, a very focused objective, and is quite, it's qualitatively different from their normal guerrilla operations. And they're able to use these, but it shows the, uh, some of the interests in uh, achieving certain objectives uh, and then uh, melting them away, transitioning back into the normal guerrilla activity, which is uh, very difficult for counterterrorists to uh, to try to address this constantly shifting and evolving uh, structure and force, uh, and, and difficult to understand. The next one is uh, the uh, my work with uh, the program on extremism's ISIS files with the Department of Soldiers. The structure, how when the guerrilla force transitions into a conventional force, how does it routinize? How does it, how does it build structure and departments and, and managing capabilities uh, in order to, to harness all of this activities, these violent activities, whether they're terrorists or suicide bombs, as Ido talked about, or the, uh, the campaigns in certain areas like Kobani or uh, Fallujah and Ramadi that uh, Ido uses as case studies within his his uh, book, um, the sources of this are quite uh, contentious and most of the time uh, aren't very well developed uh, as far as uh, they're more, much more intuitive. Uh, one that comes up frequently is the Bathist influence. Uh, and, and Ido does a great job of looking at lots of different influences on how the Islamic State can, you know, routinized and created conventional capabilities or managed these these budding cap- uh, conventional capabilities. I think is a quite convincing argument and something that I hope we'll come back to in the Q and A. And then finally, the idea of of a global insurgency is taking these lessons learned and then sharing them. Uh, as Ido talks about, across the globe into places like the the Battle for Marawi. Right? How much of the Battle of Marawi is influenced? Um, remotely by Islamic State, their their experience uh, in Mosul, in Raqqa, and in, in urban settings, uh, even Kobani, and and moving that forward. So these are um, these are some aspects that uh, I'll, I'm going to go briefly through some slides, and then I'd like to ask the Ido the first question, which is is what uh, kind of uh, when I finish reading. Uh, this book for the second time is is the question I have for Ido that I'd like him to kind of expand on a little bit. Uh, So this is some of the work that uh, I did with the program, as mentioned before, and we found evidence uh, in the ISIS files. These are archival files, uh, as well as files that we use from Tamimi's archives to to understand how they manage this large conventional uh, operate, this large conventional force that they built that had tens of thousands of people from some more recent research that uh, Milton has done at CTC that looked at the files, captured files on the, on the battlefield by the U.S. military. And you can see the, the organization, they have headquarters logistics, they have very special skills that Ito goes into great detail about, about how to develop uh, what we would call combined arms operations uh, and the ability to um, train air defenders, 
uh, for uh, the conventional forces that are against them. They have administrative, uh, which uh, again, we were able to document through these captured documents. And then the, the, uh, the indoctrination that Ito talked about earlier that comes through their uh, director of the training camps, but also kind of their human resources wing, if you will. They didn't call them these, we, we, we grouped these ourselves as we understood their purposes, but those are actual departments that were, were documented in the, in the archives. Uh, they have orders of battle with convent, you know, divisional size forces, certainly not comparable to uh, Western militaries, if you will, or, or more or state militaries, but do have uh, very standardized uh, structures as well as different types of services uh, or, uh, or armies, the Caliphate Army, the Army of Dabiq, which was, was foreign fighters that were organized largely by language and then integrated into the, Cal uh, the Caliphate Army. You don't mention this, but their quite conventional structure at the, at the unit level had Sharia advisors, which largely fulfilled or sought to achieve what Ido talks about in this will to fight. It's the, it's, and it's more than just the will to fight. It's indoctrinating them into the ideology for this much larger uh, ideological goal of, uh, of transforming entire societies. Again, going back to the revolutionary warfare aspect, this is a transformation project. Uh, it has to start uh, at the very lowest level with advisors uh, talking to the common soldiers. And this is an indication of, of really what's, what's most likely the most, one of the most ideological uh, armies that we've seen in quite some time. Uh, you can compare them to Soviet commissars or even, um, elements, some political advisors uh, in other armies of the past. <clears throat> and then finally, the, uh, the insurgency doctrine, this gets to Ito's discussion of what does the Islamic State, with its vast experience in its core areas of, of Iraq and Syria that, uh, that, have been, that they've been doing guerrilla warfare in for a decade and a half, uh, and this is uh, written about by them, as, as how they understand different phases, three phases, much like Mao uh, and what they call cumulative attrition. Uh, although I would, I, I would call it more of an exhaustion strategy. They're trying to exhaust much larger conventional opposing forces through this uh, continual um, Nikaya, the, the constant bleeding of these forces, but also very specialized targeting of key leaders uh, in different places uh, through regular warfare assassination, assassination campaigns in order to achieve uh, what, they, what they were able to achieve in 2014, which is political consolidation and control of territory. And that gets to what Ido was talking about. He mentions Libya. This is just a picture of of someone the Islamic State sent, Abu Nabil Anbari, who had originally been the Emir of Samara as part of the campaign in 2014 to uh, establish the Caliphate. And they sent him to Libya as part of uh, what I'd call ex expeditionary advising. And there's evidence that they have had advisors in West Africa from reporting from crisis group. Uh, to, and, and all of that is in the uh, interest of what Ido talked about, which is conventionalizing their provincial uh, military forces in, in ways that mimic what they were able to achieve in 2014. And of course, they have the credibility to, to do so. Um, so a couple, um, you know, looking at where is the Islamic State now, that's something that uh, we talked about as being part of the discussion moving forward. What is what does all of Ito's um, aspects uh, say? Um, you know, Michael's written a recent article with Alex Almeida on um, on the current state of the of the, of the core in in Iraq, and it's fairly stagnant, and if not declining slightly, and the, and the reasons for that are are unknown. Uh, it's quite possible that they're reserving some strength. But um, right now, all we can do is look at the, the current status as being fairly flat to, to slightly declining, at least in the, in the, in the current. Um, and it's quite a, quite a bit off of where they were in 2013. If you look at the recent prison break, um, 
I think it was a failure. It was not resourced in the manner that we have seen in uh, special operations like Abu Ghraib, which is on the outskirts of Baghdad, and yet it was a complete success against a very conventional force uh, in the outskirts of Baghdad. So um, quite a contrast to what they were able to do in 2013, and they uh, ended up, you know, 400 of their own members from that prison are dead, and that's a that's a failure. That's not something that's acceptable from the leadership and what they've expected from their abilities in the past. That's an indicator. Uh, certainly, it could be a propaganda win for them. Um, we've got the recent death of the caliph as well. After only two years without a single statement from him. Um, and reports that he was a hands-on leader, that's not a good sign because it's much better for them when he is a hands-off leader and uh, you know, doing titular responsibilities and staying alive and having his, uh, his delegated committee do the, do the real work of running the organization. So uh, there's, some, there's some issues on whether they're going to be uh, to achieve the effectiveness that Ido writes about throughout uh, this book. Um, and we've yet to see them announce a new leader. And the longer I think that they, that they wait to announce a new leader uh, might be more signs of what Michael was writing about with Alex uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, a, a, a declining trend that, um, that might, be, um, might be significant. So the question you know, I have for you, uh, now that you've finished your research, put it together and polished it with the feedback you've gotten from many uh, folks from across the field, really, really smart folks. I know you've talked to them. Um, can you elaborate on what you think is the most important source? There's lots of sources of, of ISIS military effectiveness, but could you elaborate on what you think is the most important source of, of, of Islamic state military effectiveness in, in the period that you covered, which is uh, quite an extensive period? Um, yeah, thanks for that question, uh, Professor Whiteside. Uh, yeah, that, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint one that's most important, but if I had to say at least one that was uh, most consistent, uh, it's the will to fight, uh, is that they wouldn't be able uh, to, and I would, I would add on top of that, um, an enemy that doesn't have a very high will to fight uh, at, at uh, different times. Um, they always had uh, really determined soldiers or soldiers that were, uh, you know, forced to fight and that they would, uh, they would fight effectively um, when, when needed to. Uh, and, and they would be, uh, and, and that most important thing would be determination because that's what gave, that's what added to their, to their shock, the shock effect of their uh, suicide bombs, you know, because you can send in like a, a car bomb to, to hit like a frontline position, but you need to have that, uh, that very fierce uh, in infantry assault to capitalize on it for it to be effective. And that very much came from uh, will to fight. Um, and I, I, so I would definitely look at that and it looks like they still have it. Uh, I would say that a, a big limiting factor for them now is uh, the fact that they don't have uh, all those the industry and the, uh, uh, you know all the material resources that that were that were behind that. They're not able to carry out these huge operations, like you mentioned Abu Ghraib. If I'm if I remember correctly, the 2013 assault on Abu Ghraib it took like it was like what 10 car bombs that they used, uh, and in uh, the prison break recently they used uh, a couple, um, and that's just that is a result of their uh, material weakening. And you see, even with uh, uh, continuing high will to fight, they are not able to sustain. Um, their, uh, their victories unless they have uh, some kind of uh, stronger organizational base for it. Um, and I also go into will to fight because you see it on the offense, which I just talked about, but also on the defensive, uh, which they never, they were never very successful on the defensive. They never uh, were able to defend their territory. You know, uh, we were able to take it all away from them. Uh, but on the defensive, one of the biggest things they had going for them is that they were not going to leave their positions, that they were going to fight to the end, uh, and that they, they held their ground. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of why I would be focusing on will to fight. Another thing I would add on to your uh, uh, characterization of the current threat is uh, something that's understudied, I think, is uh, what, uh, what ISIS is doing in the, the territory of uh, Bashar al-Assad. Um, right now, that, that's probably the place where they have the most freedom of movement, uh, partially because uh, Assad regime forces are not very good at fighting ISIS, uh, but also because um, 
uh, ISIS has been able to kind of carve out this little area in, in the desert region, the Badia region, um, uh, while um, uh, against even ineffective uh, Russian airstrikes, like hundreds and hundreds of Russian airstrikes that haven't really made much of a dent in the organization, uh, as well as uh, allied Iranian forces that haven't been able to do much. Uh, and again, it's a desert region, so they don't really have that material base that I, I was just talking about. Uh, but it could be a launch pad. And I think it was a launch pad in the case of the prison break operation. Anyway, yeah. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Edo. Um, and thanks for that question, Craig. And I'm glad you asked it. Um, uh, that you, you slightly mischievously put Edo on the spot because, you know, the, one of the exam questions in this whole study really was, um, you know, which of the theories or which, you know, multiple theories, which multiple of the theories uh, best explains how, why ISIS was reasonably effective as a conventional force, at least compared to their adversaries at first, bit of a mouthful. And, you know, innovation, will to fight, the shaping operations that you talk about, that you you, you wrote the book on uh, on revolutionary warfare, Craig. Um, my feelings in the, at the start were always that I didn't actually think they were that good, and I thought what was really important about them was that they had the differential that Edo talks about, which is very important, the will to fight differential. But they also had the initiative, so they could use battlefield geometry. To their advantage, they decided where the next battle was going to be. They massed in that place, whereas everyone else was spread out across an enormous containing arc. Over time, as we opened up multiple fronts, they lost that capability and they became less effective. So everyone's got their different preference. For me, it was initiative. Um, for you, it was initially revolutionary warfare, Craig, and then it you know moved into organisation, which are both very compelling uh, arguments. The will to fight one, as you as you both say, this is one of the most ideological armed forces ever to be created. Very interesting and worthy of greater study. Um, and you know, for me, interestingly, you know, when you when you look at their will to fight, sometimes it was a disadvantage even, because, as myself and Alex Almeida talked about with the defense of Mosul, the defensive tactics there. Uh, at that point, retention of the force, protection of the force, husbanding of the force was not actually something they were very good at in defense. Uh, in many cases, with this what we call tactical restlessness, they expended a lot of their capability in fruitless, almost Wehrmacht-style counter, you know, instinctive counter-offensives as soon as they got hit. And we got used to that playbook and we hit them very hard. So, you know, there's tons to talk about here. And I think even after Edo's book and, uh, you know, books like uh, Omar Ashar, you know, Ashur, you know, excellent book as well, um, there'll be lots more to say going forward. Um, let me throw out a first question, I guess, which is, which is on the shaping operations, which I always felt was very important that, you know, ISIS sort of rotted its opponents. The fact that they had a differential advantage in morale and capability and organisation was not just luck or waiting or the mistakes of their enemy, but it was also about active shaping, particularly in the tribal environment. Edo's book talks look, looks at the ideas of, you know, is it the Baathists that made these guys effective? Is it the Chechens that made these guys effective? Is it long-term long organisational learning from so many conflict zones that made these guys effective? Um, just picking one aspect of this, on the tribal engagement issue, um, Craig and, and, and Edo as well, uh, were they good at tribal engagement because the Baathists were good at tribal engagement and this was happening in Iraq? Or were they good at tribal engagement because, um, you know, the Al-Qaeda background through to Islamic State was good at tribal engagement? And there are a lot of Arabs in the mix. Why were they good at tribal engagement? Was this something that came from the long track record going back into Afghanistan with Al-Qaeda or was it something from the Baathist track record going back into their tribal engagement. Um, uh, if I'll ask Craig first, just just because you know he's the revolutionary warfare guru, and then Edo, you know, you throw in your thoughts. Over. I'll make it really short so we, we have time for for other questions. But um, I don't think it was the Bathist. I think that's almost always the the default. Um, 
the kind of answer. I don't think the Baathists were particularly good at, at engaging the tribes, although they did. It, clearly, they did engage the tribes, but it was in a top-down manner. And, and I think the Islamic State clearly had to do it bottom-up. So that is a quite different dynamic that required a lot. I think the Islamic State was was terrible at engaging the tribes at first uh, because they are so ideological, going to Ido's point. They, they were so ideological, they, they felt much like the Baathists did, that, that the tribes were, were kind of the yesterday um, thing. And they, had to, they learned the hard way. Uh, their tribal engagement came a long way. And it's, 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 it's what's very always been interesting to me is how they've evolved and struggled with how to deal with tribes that were obstinate to them, that have fought them from the beginning. So the tribes out in Haditha, for example, have never, you know, never bent the knee. And so, and never, you know, as a result have, have had difficulties in, in places in, in the heart of Anbar, right? Which we think of as, as their heart. So I, I would, I think it's something that they learned. So it goes back to your learning organization, um, your comment. Uh, yeah, I, I generally agree. It's um, a lot of people go to the Baathists because it's, uh, it's kind of an easy explanation. Uh, but my, the argument that I that I kind of make in the book is that if uh, the Baath, there were former Saddam regime people involved in ISIS before it was ISIS when it was Al Qaeda in Iraq as well, um, and they did. Some of them became important leaders, uh, but. Uh, if their influence was so important for tribal engagement, we should have seen them be more successful um, earlier on. We should have seen uh, like the awakening uh, the, after the mm -hmm. concurrent with the US uh, surge of forces in 2007 uh, in Iraq, we should have seen uh, the tribes not, uh, or tribes or different uh, local groups that we should not have seen them uh, join the, the coalition side, the US side and the Iraqi side. We, if they were so good at it, we should have seen them uh, stay uh, allied with uh, Al Qaeda or other jihadis. Um, we didn't see that. And so I think that's, uh, and uh, if you go back to different ISIS documents that were captured over those years, you see that there was kind of introspection into, wow, how, how, why did we fail at this? Like why uh, jihadi is asking themselves, like, why, why do the, why don't they, why don't the tribes like us? Like, so, you know, why do they hate us? Um, so, uh, and there was kind of an introspection about this uh, that I think led to kind of a more nuanced strategy when ISIS emerged in, in 2013 and was able to uh, more effectively turn different tribes against each other, co-opt some, uh, make deals with others, uh, be very harsh with some of them. Uh, like you see, there was uh, that one tribe that um, hundreds of its members were massacred when, when ISIS, uh, I don't remember exactly which one it was. But anyway, you see, uh, you see a, a mix of all that. They, weren't, they didn't only take the harsh route, they also uh, were, took the co-opting route or some more conciliatory or uh, you know, offering economic opportunity, things like that. Um, so this kind of nuance developed over time, and I would I would say definitely it wasn't the Baathist influence. It was definitely more uh, their their experience during the Iraq War in two thousand three to twenty eleven, and their introspection about it over time. Thanks very much. Now you know we got tons of questions coming in, uh, so I'm going to bundle some together. So you know, Edo and Craig, um, sketch any of this down with with pen and paper if you if it's going to help you remember it because i'm going to bundle up a couple of things together um so a lot of the questions a lot of what we're talking about suggest that islamic state is good at retaining and building on organizational knowledge even though as we know these guys suffered some really horrendous rates of attrition they leadership casualties decapitation uh constant movement, loss of files, all the rest of it. So the question, the bundled questions are, um, how did this organization build on its experience when it suffered such heavy losses? Was it saving grace that, it, you know, people ended up in prisons instead of getting killed and that allowed them to save a lot of their, their, their manpower, their, their experience? So how did they preserve and expand and retain the sort of knowledge from one generation to another? Was there a system to do that? Second, um, riffing off one of the questions, were they particularly good at advise assist to you know, local partner forces that they were raising and expanding during this period? And the third, um, 
you know, one of the early questions. Uh, how important is decapitation as a way to, to reduce the for future capabilities of the Islamic State? You know, not generally is it overstated as a tool, or so, but, you know, do you, do you think more decapitation of mid-level leaders would actually finish this organisation off? Or are they always going to be able to retain experience, transfer it, and just find new people um, to, to, let's say, stay at the current level of operations? So loads of stuff in there, uh, but pick it apart, you know, the bits you find most interesting. Um, let's start with you, Edo, this time. Uh, yeah, thanks. Really interesting questions. Um, so how did they retain that knowledge? Uh, so I, I will say that uh, ISIS is very good at um, creating bureaucracy, creating institutions that uh, would kind of hold knowledge uh, for different, um, for, for new recruits. Uh, they have very standardized, uh, they seem to have very standardized training programs uh, with like a standardized amount of days. Uh, they would have like scouting for uh, for specialized uh, capabilities that, uh, for example, snipers or uh, anti-tank teams. They would have uh, specialists who who, uh, who are expert in that um, or elite in that field. They would come and they would handpick, uh, you know, recruits for for their units. So they were very good at doing that from the, the training uh, perspective. They were also good at absorbing uh, knowledge from foreign fighters uh, that if uh, a lot of people talk about the Russian speaking foreign fighters, which they did. They came with like a unique set of, uh, of skills. Many of them did. Um, they were known for having more technical knowledge and things like that. And uh, in many ways they did. And, and they were good at uh, disseminating this, uh, I think, through training, uh, through sending special advisors uh, to different places. And you see that with the province, with the other provinces outside of Iraq and Syria. Um, and that brings me to where they're good at uh, advise and assist for their uh, their other provinces. Uh, I would say to an uh, it kind of depends on how much they invested, but yes, they, they were pretty good at it. Uh, you see in Libya, for example, um, you know, uh, our, our colleague Aaron Zelen has a lot of great work on this, but uh, a, lot, a lot of the leaders of ISIS in Libya, a lot of its uh, uh, commanders, they came from either they were foreign fighters from Syria uh, who had fought in uh, the, the uh, Syrian civil war, um, or they were, uh, you know, they could have also been people from North Africa, from Libya and other countries who traveled to Syria to fight in the war, came back to Libya uh, to uh, create the Islamic State um, uh, franchise there. And you see also that Libya was where they were most successful outside of Iraq and Syria, I would say. Um, and taking territory and, and defending it, it was very it kind of ran parallel to how the caliphate was doing in Iraq and Syria. And that's very much because they were able to send this knowledge and, and high quality personnel from the core organization out, outward. In Nigeria, you also saw where they're still doing fairly well uh, compared to other places. Um, they, uh, they did benefit from a lot of advice from, from foreign fighters. Uh, we see um, there's evidence of, of uh, uh, sometimes North Africans or, or other uh, foreign fighter countries going to Nigeria to advise uh, the Islamic uh, State West Africa province. Uh, we see a similar dynamic in the Philippines, but you kind of see that where they invested the most, which is Libya, is where they also have the most success. So it kind of mm -hmm. um, runs parallel to, so, so it seems they were pretty effective at it. Um, it just depends on how much they were willing to put into it. And to decapitation, uh, I will say that it, for ISIS, um, you know, for there are some terrorist organizations that can suffer um, exponentially, you know, much worse than ISIS did from decapitation. Uh, for example, we know the, the case of the Tamil Tigers where they lost their leader and the organization basically collapsed after that. Uh, but with ISIS, because of all this bureaucratization, institutionalization that I was just talking about, they, they, they really retain a lot of uh, stuff independent of the leader. Um, and so decapitation will have a, a kind of uh, diminishing gains in that sense. Uh, and also during the war with ISIS, uh, during the, the time period that I cover in my book in particular, you don't see uh, decapitation having a huge effect overall. There, uh, I'm talking about like now mid-level commanders, uh, things like that. Um, you, there were some times, uh, I, particularly I think in, in the battle for West Mosul, which was really when they were on their last legs in Iraq, 
where uh, we were able to take out a lot of their mid-level commanders in succession, and that did have a disorienting effect. But um, the, you know, that's that's like a huge effort. You have to destroy a lot of leaders at once. You have to have a lot of intel. So generally, with the Islamic State, you'll have diminishing returns with decapitation. Well, uh, Craig. That was an excellent answer. So I'll just highlight from some archival research just to support everything that Ido said in, in, in a complimentary manner. At least I'll try. Uh, their media department going to, to the retention of information and, and passing that along. Their media department has had an, an archive since at least 2005, uh, pre, pre, pre uh, you know, their predecessor organization. And that we see things from that archive constantly pop back up. Their media department is, is not single focused on propaganda. It's an information warehouse that, that uh, is kept, you know, is able to repopulate and, and to transfer ideas, at least, you know, in written or uh, video form type of stuff. So that helps when you do have the attrition that you talked about, Michael. Uh, bureaucracies. So there's always been a debate about uh, leaderless flat organizations or you know networked insurgencies but these guys are bureaucracy bureaucracies are 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 excellent at one thing they're you know they're pain in other ways but they're excellent at retaining expertise and and having the you know diversifying the expertise in very special specialized aspects that Ido talked about and so uh the ability to keep knowledge and to continue to train these these expertise is what bureaucracies do and i don't think we'd, we've ever seen a a group or a movement that's had the the, the structure and bureaucracy that this particular one has it's their it's their calling card from an advising perspective, uh, the really interesting thing is they learned it through their political consolidation. I just wrote a piece on this uh, with a partner, Nadine. Um, they've, they've been practicing advising smaller insurgent groups since the early Iraq war. And, and that expanded when they moved into Syria and they used this expertise to kind of hone their advising skills that Ido just, just talked about. I won't, I won't mention that, but so it's, a, it's, it's, they had, you know, people like uh, Abu Muhammad al Adnani, their longtime spokesman, very famous front guy. I had a picture of him in my in my slides. He was dual hatted early on in the Iraq War as a totally different leader, even though he had pledged allegiance to Surakawi even before the invasion. So this is someone they had. They have stalkers in and dual hatted people who are 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 kind of mentoring and growing like associate groups that eventually kind of. Uh, you know, once they adopt and understand the methodology, they just kind of morph into the larger uh, organization, which I thought was really interesting because I thought it was much more of a straight organization. You're in or you're out. And, and I, I'm pretty convinced now that that's not the case. And the last thing is, uh, is the leader decapitation issue. You know, there are key leaders, at least from the key leaders part, um, you know, address the mid-level issue. That's probably where leader decapitation is the most effective at a temporary effect, but it, it's a pressure tactic. It's nothing more than that. It can have strategic effects, uh, but the Islamic states largely inoculated themselves from that. Um, and they understood that when they had their very charismatic leader, Zarqawi, and how do you succeed as Zarqawi, right? No one succeed. No one can actually walk in the shoes of a Zarqawi to take this organization forward. So they created purposely anonymous, like Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, who people have probably never even heard of, uh, but is actually the, the long range successor of, of Zarqawi. But they have low profiles, they're anonymous, and when they're taken off the battlefield, uh, um, it's not a it's not a huge devastating loss. However, and they're replaceable. They're they're supposed to be replaceable, just like the current one is. He's supposed to be replaceable. That said, they have to they have to have the qualifications in order to maintain the legitimacy, uh, and that's more important than ever before. Now that they're a global enterprise and competing with Al Qaeda globally, uh, but also wanting to dominate globally, as Ido said, not just compete but dominate. And um, you know if they if they mess up their leadership succession practice, which has been honed and, and developed, but if they, if they mess that up because of a leader decapitation, then that, that's going to have a significant impact on them. Wow, this has been um, really pro protein rich. I've really enjoyed this. Um, let me ask you, I mean, we're up on time. Um, do you think we've got time for one or two more questions or do you guys have to uh, drop off? I mean, you know, some people will, will have to leave at this point, but it's um, I think it's worth just continuing this for one more quick round of questions. Um, one 
thing that's come in a bit through the Q and A, and that I've often thought about as well, is um, how these guys used maths on the battlefield. Were they able to mass on the battlefield? You know, I don't think I really understood until seeing some of the recent organisational evidences that they were as big as they were. When coalition would say there's this many thousands of them, I think I don't know about that. I mean that that doesn't that sounds a bit too big to me for what I'm seeing. And so I'm just you know a lot of mi Middle East irregular forces have problems with understrength line frontline forces a lot of the we i remember being in iraq during this 2014 through 17 period and observing the empty battlefield you know a very empty battlefield um yet you know we know that they actually mobilize very significant numbers of people so what did they mainly use these these mass forces for i mean were these primarily rear area and internal security forces uh did they have an excessive tail to tooth ratio or were they just smart in only dribbling tactical forces forward onto the front edge of battle because of enemy air power and other things um you know i'm just interested whether you have any thoughts about how they used mass let's start off with craig this time and then move to Ida. yeah that, that's a great question I it's it's clear that they were able to mobilize large numbers of peoples in the tens of thousands and it's estimated at over 60,000 according to records that have been captured on the battlefield the overwhelming majority of them i think 80 percent of them were foot soldiers in the department of soldiers uh so they didn't have that uh that aspects that that you're asking about at least according to the captured documents and those were in iraq and not syria so it might have looked quite different in in syria but um and i think Quite a few of those were either uh, attrited or probably deserted or or in or in detention camps right now. Um, I would I would estimate because they were foot soldiers and even though uh, Ido talked about the indoctrination being such a priority and I I discussed the 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 level of the you know the level of effort they tried to do to get Sharif down at. Um, down at the lowest level, that wasn't always possible. I mean, it's hard. You could, you, they didn't have that many well-trained um, religious experts that could indoctrinate the people, uh, even though they put substantial effort in. You know, I think over, I think almost half of their basic training was was indoctrination, was religious indoctrination. To go to Ido's larger point. Uh, so a lot of those were treated and probably left. And I, I don't think even despite the indoctrination efforts, I don't think they were imbued with the ideology long enough to to have decided that the uh, Islamic State was the, the, the organization that they're going to be in for life. As Ido said, um, that's just there, there's just um, the ones that fought in Mosul, Iraq to, to the to the end. Sure. But uh, I would imagine the rest of them, it was probably a huge mistake for them. So I, I agree with you. I, I think the numbers uh, are are fairly cloudy and it's probably lower than we think. I see. Right. So and, and you know, Edo, you, you looked a lot at the kind of tactical and grand tactical end of the spectrum. You know, did you see any areas where ISIS really did use mass, where it actually employed significant numbers of forces or limited frontages and massed forces for breakthrough effect. I know they did that with suicide, you know, armored suicide car bombs, but with actual, you know, ground troops, did they ever try and actually fight like a shoulder to shoulder military in any area? Uh, yeah, so I would say generally what you mentioned in the beginning, the empty battlefield is more their style as the war went on. But in the beginning, what you saw was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the times you saw huge masses sometimes. Uh, Battle of Kobani, I think, is the bit of, biggest uh, example of this, where they had like a division sized by our standards, division sized mm -hmm. force of uh, something, as many as 12,000 people in one place and Kobani is really small. So, uh, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of uh, people. And the way they fought at Kobani was also, they had, that's when they had like the height of their uh, heavy weapons uh, that they acquired through um, or their early conquests in Iraq and Syria. Uh, and they really did fight quite convention, like conventionally in the way that we might imagine in the Western uh, military. Uh, until I would say uh, we got involved, the U.S. got involved, and, and you started seeing airstrikes, um, a lot of things that forced them to disperse. And they, 
at first, um, I, I'd say they adapted pretty quickly to this. And, and what you see is that they they created this empty battlefield for um, pretty quickly, where they could uh, uh, they found ways to cope with airstrikes by um, either using buildings, uh, hiding among civilians, using civ uh, civilians as human shields again, like. They have, they have no regard for this, so they, they can do all this stuff. Uh, they uh, uh, hiding underground uh, in the Battle of Mosul, especially you see like networks of, of uh, mouse holes, like uh, blown out walls between buildings. Uh, you'd see um, a lot of different ways that they would do this. They would even put, um, sometimes it was really easy for them to do this too. It's like, if you see at the Battle of Aguz uh, in, in the end, they would, sometimes they would just use tents because of our rules of engagement that we're not allowed to uh, attack if, if we can't ascertain that there are no civilians. Uh, and so it, it really complicated uh, our efforts. Uh, you would even see them putting up smoke screens by destroying oil uh, tankers, or oil, oil fields. And they actually did that uh, in the, the battle of uh, the, the prison break recently. One of their car bombs hit an oil tanker and that caused a huge smoke screen. But, so, yeah, so uh, they they kind of adapted to this quickly and we do see still that they, they use the uh, larger numbers of people um, in, on the defensive, but uh, they would be much more dispersed. So yes, they did use mass, uh, particularly in the beginning, but uh, they learned over time how to kind of disperse their forces to deal with uh, airstrikes and things like that. Those uh, eventually wasn't enough for them to, to be successful. Uh, but yeah, they did learn how to do it. It's almost, you know, from time I spent over in Yemen, you know, looking at how the Houthis uh, adapted to enemy air superiority, air supremacy. You know, it, there, there is this very, very lightweight front line outpost line, which is constantly being fed from almost World War One style Stalin you know, where you're kind of feeding people forward into the defense line in very small driblets so that they can't be targeted by uh, air power. This sort of the, the, the largest tactical unit is what can fit on the back of a trail bike. Um, if I could actually say, say that for yeah, one thing I found very interesting and in, uh, that I document in my book is uh, when the Iraqi army was advancing to Mosul, uh, they had to take over all the towns, Kayar and, and others. Uh, they would, you sometimes see huge operational withdrawals of, of ISIS forces, huge amounts of soldiers that would, that would be withdrawn from these different territories. And the way they would protect themselves is um, sometimes they would be out in the open and just have a huge number of civilians uh, packed in between because they're, they're this Islamic state. They would take their families, they would take other civilians, people sometimes force people to come with them and it would just make it hard for us uh, to target them. But yeah. Mm. And, it, you know, why I mentioned this idea of the sort of atomized armed forces that, you know, we're talking about the semi-conventional, conventional warfare fighting capabilities of ISIS, but conventional warfare itself is changing, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, even, even the largest armed forces are starting to operate in smaller and smaller packets, more and more mobile. So why wouldn't they uh, as well? And I think sometimes I look at these unconventional armed forces in the region and I think we have a lot to learn from them in terms of, uh, you know, how they respond to a overwhelming strike environment in which they cannot mass in any sense or they'll be destroyed and how they manage to keep fighting under these conditions. There's a lot to learn there, probably. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one question out to um, or uh, take the question from Vladimir van Bilgenberg, who's my, uh, my co-author on uh, Accidental Allies. He says uh, to Craig Whiteside, isn't the ISIS prison break a success for ISIS uh, because it was so much covered in the international media and, you know, there are claims that, uh, you know, some uh, a number of ISIS leaders or members escaped, less than 200. So, you know, the basic idea is um, uh, even though it's not an Abu Ghraib 2013, um, is this still a significant success for them, do you think, in terms of attention grabbing and perhaps leadership? Free. Yeah, that, re that remains to be seen. Um, you know, did they did those two hundred escape, or were they just unaccounted for and then later turned up dead? Because, I mean, this is not how the Islamic State does prison breaks. And I, again, not to read, I'd hesitate to read into and too much into any one particular incident. 
But prison breaks are very sensitive targets because of the people that are in there and they want to get them out. Uh, they're usually inside, inside out and then outside in uh, collaboration so that there's and, and quite often have bribed uh, the some of the guards in some of these. They've had a lots of successful prison breaks. So it is a, it is one of many prison breaks they've tried to do over the years. Not all of them have gone well, but um the amount of people they put against this, as Ito talked about, is just, it's quite dangerous what they did. And it's clear that they kill, they, you know, the result, you don't, ne you never know what the results of, of war or a war actions are going to be. But clearly this, uh, I would, I would say it's almost a sign of desperation on, on their part. And it does get propaganda lines this, uh, <clears throat> these are vulnerable spots. This is these are larger policy issues, which are why do we have these people in such dangerous areas that are so lightly secured, um, and we know their targets. So the, all those aside, <clears throat> those are sticky policy issues that are not going to get solved anytime soon. To include repatriation of foreign fighters that are in these places, uh, but I would I would <clears throat> I. You know, other than the propaganda headlines, those are transitory and, you know, those are those come and go and we'll forget about that in a week or two. But, the, you know, those 400 ISIS members are now dead and we don't know if they were important people or not. But you, that, that was, that's part of the why I would consider this in the long run. You know, if you're doing a, uh, an introspective after action review, as Ito talked about, is the practice of this group. It's probably we're not doing that again. <laughs> Okay, let me um, let me ask another one, which hopefully you know Edo and um, and Craig can answer quickly. But uh, why doesn't ISIS do more urban mass casualty attacks? You know, once upon a time it used them as a means of kind of bring itself back to the surface. Um, no one's expecting them to get back up to 2012, 2013 multi-city strikes straight away, but it's just very notable that they don't seem to try it almost at all. Is it really that hard to do these kind of strikes in today's Iraq or Syria? Um, and if not, why are they not doing them? Uh, Ido, do you want to kick off and then uh, Craig can take it? And we'll go for reasonably tight answers uh, as we're yeah. getting down to the wire. Sure, I'm going to try to keep it real short. But uh, it's not that they... I think that they they probably can. It's not. Uh, it might take some more planning, but we've seen them do it, like in uh, the bombing in Baghdad, I think, last year. Um, so it's not that they can't do it necessarily. It's more that I think their goals. Uh, this is kind of just. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, a lot of evidence for this, but it looks to me like their goals are are not to uh, hit urban centers right now. It's to kind of create space for them in uh, in different areas, like in in like I said, Assad regime territory. It's much more useful for them to hit the Assad regime, to hit Iranian forces, to hit uh, whatever pro-regime group is there because they back off and that creates space for them. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think that's what they're kind of going for right now. And the same is also in, in other parts of Syria and Iraq as well. I think a lot of their urban attacks were to stir up sectarian um, conflict. And uh, I'm not sure if like the political dynamics in Iraq right now, I'm not sure if that's something that a terrorist attack will be able to uh, affect right now in Iraq. I, I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, that's last. Yeah, I thought that was a great answer. I, I think it goes back to what Ito was talking about, about the shaping operations. And right now they're deep in the rural shaping operations. That's the focus. Anything outside of that focus is just uh, resources that are directed against things that are not, again, might get you some headlines for a little bit, but headlines do, does not control territory. It doesn't make a lot of money for you, uh, you know, in, in many cases, uh, especially with the counterfinancing regimes that they're facing against right now. Um, I don't think, I think their goals have changed, just like you do have says, I don't think it makes them as much. Maybe, you know, obviously what we've seen in the past, at least in the urban fights in, in Iraq or Syria, uh, are tied to maybe fixing governmental forces in one area so they can surge in other areas, but they're, they're, they're not even there yet. So they're, they're at a such a low level, I think, that they, it just doesn't make sense from a strategic perspective. I think this group is strategic. They do have to do, they have to do these things, but they have, there has to be a benefit to doing them. And Ito's right. The sectarian okay. aspect is not as hot as it was back in the day. Okay. So uh, one final question, a fun one for both of you. Um, 
When did we see the conventional forces of the Islamic State break and flee? Did we see them suffer an ideological or morale collapse on any of the key battlefields? Or is this a force that, that didn't really experience that throughout the course of this 2014 through 17, 18, 19 war? Uh, let's kick off with Craig and then we'll finish on Ida. I, I don't... I don't think they did. It's really interesting uh, in that Department of Soldiers paper I wrote for the program on extremism, I made various comparisons to the Nazis, the, the, the German, the Wehrmacht uh, as well, and really the Wehrmacht. And you know, those, they were directed to fight in, in place all in, in, you know, from 1943 on all the way back. And it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing uh, will to fight aspect that you was talking about this particular group. The Islamic State did it smarter, to be honest. They they really they they had to they had to hold Raqqa and Mosul because of the because of the importance to them and how they built those up in their propaganda. But at the same time, those were small stay behind forces relative to their larger force. And they had there's a lot of evidence, um, you know, a lot of people have written about how they've transitioned even during the Battle of Mosul for the future, the long fight. They were thinking about the long fight. Unlike Nazi Germany, they weren't planning on ending, you know, uh, in Mosul and Raqqa with all of their, you know, arrayed of forces. They were already transitioning to, to the long global insurgency. And, you know, that's what's made them successful. So they they did see defeats. Baghuz obviously is a very symbolic, you know, stand and die, but it if you look at the number of forces in any of those three battles I mentioned, it's not significant to their larger um, population. Yeah, uh, I generally agree with that. And when it comes to withdrawal, breaking and running, almost never. I, I, I think it's hard to say that there was, a, there was ever even an instance of this happening on a mass scale, uh, not on the strategic or operational levels for sure. Um, you can talk about surrenders. Uh, like they, they've had... Um, at different times, uh, fighters that surrendered. I've heard, for example, uh, in Manvich, after the SDF uh, took back Manvich, there was a surrender. Uh, and of course, after Baguz. Uh, but, you know, was the motivation uh, just demoralization or was it, was there actually, with Baguz, we know for sure there was actually a plan, uh, at least some kind of plan behind uh, surrendering in order to infiltrate refugee camps and, and prisons and things like that uh in the absence of better options um but yeah we really never see such huge uh like routes um you know that, that we might see in other in other wars uh i will say on the tactical level you might see that sometimes i i've heard from u.s officers that uh if you uh, drop an airstrike near an isis fighter that's a good way to get them to run run the hell the other way or something like that but uh you know, again, is that demoralization or is that just, you know, self-preservation um, carrying on the fight? So. All right, guys. Well, listen, we went a little long, but I personally found this fascinating. You know, I can see from the numbers of participants that stayed on, as well as those who are coming in through the live streaming, that um, other people found it interesting too. Uh, thanks both for the work that you've done on, uh, on these issues and continue to do. It's required reading uh, for everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to give one final plug to uh, Soldiers of End Times uh, by Edo, uh, which is a great piece of work uh, to go take a look at. I recommend you all read uh, you know, all of the works that are coming out uh, by uh, Professor Craig Whiteside. Uh, because they are they're basically all hits. Uh, you don't, you know, there's uh, you never waste your time reading uh, reading Craig's stuff. And um, you know, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, we'll be doing some more briefings here at the Washington Institute through the Military Security Studies and the Counterterrorism Programs and others uh, on these issues of Islamic State, of jihadist conventionalization, and of by with and through operations, which will probably be the uh, the subject of Edo's uh, next and future work. Uh, so thanks very much uh, today and uh, uh, goodbye. Uh, have a good day. Bye. Thank you both. Thank uh, you. Congratulations, uh, Michael, on your latest piece. And Edo, uh, great job. Congratulations. And uh, thanks for making such a great product. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, really been an honor uh, sharing the stage with you. Uh, the honor is mine. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.